so good, so good. Well, take your seats. Help us, Jesus. So good. So it is up to me to wrap this whole thing up. And I don't know if you've noticed, but we've had a bit of a theme. Anybody? It's kind of just in every item, in every word, in every session, we have tried to to just emphasize and, and just speak of this female community. You know that we need each other, that the enemy would want to separate us, the enemy would want to isolate us. The enemy uses challenges and crisis and hardship to make us feel like we are on our own and that nobody understands and that nobody sees and that nobody cares or nobody could fix it. But that is not the truth. That in the body of Christ, God gifts us to each other. And what I want to share with you at the right at the last moment this session is that I want you to share your story. I want you to to open up. You know, this started in my heart, this desire for this community that, that stretched, hands stretched from the older women to the younger women, the, the, the circle of age groups and experiences and wisdom. This started in my heart a few years ago where I read a book. And um, the Red Book has been made into a series on Netflix called The Red Tent. And uh, I read it years ago when I was in Sheffield. But uh, this notion of the red tent captured my imagination. And what it was, it was a reimagining, it's a story of Dinah, Jacob's daughter. And it's a reimagining of the story of Dinah, which we don't hear very much. It's like a a verse or so in the, in, uh, the Old Testament. But the author, Anita Diamant, she, she reimagined Dinah's story. And what I loved about it was the fact that it gave a lot of historical context to a people who were largely nomadic. They didn't stay in one place. And that they lived amongst, obviously, their, their cattle and their livestock, but in tents. And because women, when they reached that time of the month, were considered unclean, that there was something called the red tent. That when all the women were at that time, they were all synchronized, like like in the family that happens. Doesn't that happen with everybody just synchronizes? Well... All these women were synchronized and then ostracized from the rest of the of the tribe and they would go for a week into the red tent and then the stories would start the older women would share stories with the younger women the younger women would ask questions and they would talk and laugh and share and this, this concept just thought, I thought, bring back the red tent. I'm saying that time of the month, everybody disappears. I am there. We go to a tent. We hang out with our girlfriends. Come on. What it could be better than that? But the other thing is that it made me feel sad because we've lost a little bit of that interaction between the older generation and the younger generation. I mean, if you were fortunate to live in the same place and have your grandparents and perhaps your great-grandparents around you, and then, or if you are a grandmother to have your children and your children's children around you, that is not the reality for most of us. In our world today, we are moving, we are changing countries, we are changing jobs, we're moving around at such a quick pace. This is the longest, in Manchester, we've been here 10 years, this is the longest I've ever lived anywhere. We move. We say goodbye to our family and friends and to our support structure and to our security mechanisms. And then we find ourselves in places where we feel unknown and we feel 
disconnected, isolated. And so I thought, red tent. Surely that's something that is in God's heart. You know, I was reading a book and uh, it was talking about the Hebrew being very picturesque. It's a picture language, a little bit like Egyptian. And the book I was reading said that there was the picture for father was a tent, a covering, a protection. And I thought, oh, doesn't that just speak of what God has done for us? He covers us, he protects us so that we can live inside this community. I want you to share your story. I need your story. The girl next to you needs your story. The girl behind you needs your story. Wouldn't it be amazing is that for some of us or for all of us in here that the answer or the healing to our story is actually found in somebody else's? Wouldn't it be a tragedy if your healing was actually in the woman next to you but she just never shared her story? She never felt that she could. She never thought that you'd want to hear it. She never thought that it was important enough. Our stories matter. Let me just share a couple of scriptures with you. They're going to help us. Hebrews 13 verse 3 says, But encourage one another daily. Encourage one another daily. And then it says, As long as it's called today. So when do I encourage somebody? Today. And then tomorrow, when tomorrow becomes today, then today. And so on and so forth. And then it says, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Your protection, or the girl's next to you's protection from sin's deceitfulness is your encouragement. Without your encouragement, she may be defenseless. Encourage each other with your stories today. Encourage. It's not encouragement like, oh, you're so pretty. Although, feel free. Encouragement means to put courage inside. And that's what I feel as a woman. I feel like my job is to put courage inside. The things that I know, the things that I have fought for, the things that I have won in my own life, that it is my job, my responsibility to take what I know and put courage on the inside so that our girls are not defenseless. The next scripture I want to share with you is something that I spoke on in my first session with us um, yesterday, and that is John 20, verse 24 and 28. And it says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Now we know that this is the time when Jesus has died. He's been buried in the ground for three days and now he has risen. Woo! Good news. And then he has appeared to his disciples, but Thomas was not there. But he said to the disciples, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his nails were. And I put my hand in his side. Whoa. This guy was serious. He's like, don't take a photo. (laughs) Don't give me a picture. Don't draw me a sketch. I need to put my hand in his side. (laughs) And he says, if I don't do that, I will not. If it's, unless I do that, I will not believe. Verse 26, a week later, the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting. 
and believe. And Jesus said to him, my Lord, my God. It wasn't until he saw the scars. Not until he saw the wound did he believe. The power of your story. You know, we had this situation. I don't, we had a recently a staff retreat where we take all of our staff away and we just spend some time together eating and hanging out. Also, um, you know, just speaking encouragement, inspiration into our staff because it's family. So we went away and we were just before taking our vision offering for our new building um, back in before November last year. Before we took the vision offering in the body of the church, we took it in our staff first. Like, we go first. We, we pave the way. And so Glenn thought it would be a great idea. <laughs> I only take 15 minutes. That before each person or couple put their offering into a bucket, that we would all tell our story of I remember where I was sat, which is the theme of our vision offering. Everybody can remember where they were sat when they first heard about God and they were first gave their life to Jesus. Everybody remembers where they were. But what we're doing with our new building is that we're creating space for somebody else to have that experience. So we thought, wouldn't it be lovely if like all the staff just shared, I remember where I was sat story. Oh my word. Can I just tell you, three hours later, we had cried solidly for three hours just weeping at the story after story of the goodness of God, of where everybody had come from and the journey they had been on. I'm like, I am a blubbering mess and I was not alone. And there were not just the girls. And uh, it, was, it was powerful. But you know what? embarrassed me. I had known a lot of those people for many years, many years, and I had never heard their story. It was powerful. It was encouraging. It was inspiring. It just made you want to praise God all over again. Your story matters. The thing is, is that we minimize our story. We say it's insignificant. We say it, it's not a good story, especially those who've been brought up in church. You've been brought up in church. You've loved Jesus since you were a child. You've not done drugs. You've not, you know, you, you know, you've not messed up your life in a major way. You just one day, when you were young, recognized you needed a savior. And you've walked with the Lord. That was boring. It was boring. And we minimize our story and we say, it's, it's not a good story. Or oh, we're so ashamed of our story that we fear that people might reject us if we t- share our story. But there is a place for your story. You might think, I'm a private person. I don't like to tell people about myself. We still need your story. Check this scripture out. It's Psalm 40, the one that we talked about last night where it says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my voice. But this is further down at verse 9. And I'm going to read it from the message translation. This is uh, the psalmist says, I've preached you to the whole congregation. I've kept nothing back. God, you know that. I didn't keep the news of your ways a secret. I didn't keep it to myself. I told it all. How dependable you are. How thorough. I didn't hold back pieces of love and truth for myself. I told it all. Let the congregation know the whole story. And sometimes we think about preaching as what I'm doing right now, but preaching isn't what I'm doing. Preaching is declaring truth. Any place where you can 
declare truth in a conversation under, over a coffee, over a meal, walking to work. You are preaching. And the, I love the sentiment of the psalmist that says, I have held nothing back. Let the whole congregation, let the whole gathering of women, let the whole community of women, the wealth of women know the whole truth. How dependable you are. How thorough. How good. How faithful. How true. This is not a time to be silent. Your story matters. This is not the time to hold back. This is the time to declare truth. To declare what God has done. If you are within the sound of my voice, and you have put your trust in Jesus, and you become a daughter of the Most High God, and you've become clean from your sin, and God has made you a new creation, and He has redeemed you from the pit, from the mud and the mire, if He has lifted you up and put your feet on a rock and given you a firm place to stand, then you have a story. It doesn't matter that your life isn't together. It doesn't matter that you haven't got all your ducks in the row. It doesn't matter you're one big hot mess. All of us feel like one big hot mess. You still have a story. And it's a good story. There's nothing small about your story. There's nothing insignificant about your story. And it needs to be shared. What I love about Thomas is that Thomas said, I will not believe until I put my hand in his side and I would put my fingers in his hands. It was the scars that made him believe. Some of you say, I have a lot of scars and I'm ashamed of my scars. I've made some big mistakes and I've got the scars to prove it, but I don't show my scars. I hide my scars. Can I just say there are going to be some people who will believe in the Lord Jesus, but only when they see your scars. It's not time to be silent, and it's not time to hide our scars. It's time to show our scars, to tell the whole truth of what God has done. Some people say, I'm not ready. I haven't got my ducks in a row. Can I just talk to the people who say, so my scars are still raw. My scars are still open. My scars still hurt. My, star my scars have not been healed, even then, you can show your scars. Even then, you're not going to tell you why. Because maybe someone else's story is going to help heal your scars. Maybe another woman, older, younger, maybe a friend, is going to be part of the story of your healing. I remember when I was in Sheffield, and it was probably the most difficult time of my life. And if you've read my book, I've, I've spoken about it in my book. But I've never felt so isolated, so alone in my whole life. And I'm in the ministry, I'm a pastor, and I'm married. Shirley Glynn was talking about me being his best friend. Well, at that time, I didn't feel like that. I felt alone. I felt abandoned. I felt unknown, un misunderstood. And it was, like Catherine said, killing me on the inside to the point where I couldn't even think straight. I wasn't happy with my marriage. I wasn't happy with my, my being a mom. I wasn't happy being a wife. I wasn't happy about being a pastor. I wasn't happy about being in England. I wasn't happy about anything. I felt like one big fat failure. But I didn't share it with anybody 
because I thought, what if they think less of me? What if they, what if they reject me? What if they think, and you're a pastor? Like, you know, somebody take the badge off her because she's clearly unfit. Real, real fear, fear of rejection. And I wasn't doing well. I know I wasn't doing well. And there was an older lady in the church and she, I thought of all the people I know, I thought, I think I'm going to talk to her. She invited me for a lunch, and I knew it was because I wasn't doing well. The cracks were beginning to show, people. <laughs> There's only so much that, um, you know, that, that crack filler can do. Poly filler, that's it. <laughs> Sorry, I just remembered this thing called... Oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so... There's only, I, was, I wasn't holding it together, and I remember going out for lunch uh, with this wonderful older lady, and um, we were driving to the lunch thing, and I felt like I needed to get my cards on the table. So I said to her, look, I'm going to tell you what's going on, okay? I'm going to show my scars. And she's like, oh, okay. And I said, I don't want you to help me. I don't want you to give me advice. I don't want you to tell me what you think I should do because I don't think you know me well enough. <laughs> she kind of looked at me and went, well, all right, all right, all right. And so I just spent the lunch just, I didn't even know if it made sense. I went from one topic to another and I was like just, just spewing it all out. And nothing, and this, and I'm so frustrated with this. And I felt like I sounded like a crazy person. And then I kind of ran out of things to say and then she kind of looked at me and I was ready for the, I think you need professional help. (laughs) Or, oh my, you know, that that kind of, that look that says, I'm just going to pretend that that wasn't all horrifying and shocking and say, no, (laughs) but really, I'm horrified. I was waiting for that. But what she did was, is that she just said, so I think God's just doing something. And I went, really? Like, really? You mean I'm not insane? And she said, no. She said, God's just up to something. Tell you what, that was the beginning of healing. She didn't give me three points of what to do. She just heard me. I felt heard. And I didn't feel judged. And all she did was confirm that God had his hand on my life. You need to show your scars even when they're not healed because there could be healing for you as you're being heard. That's what happens in the red tent. We listen. We hear. We understand. And we don't judge. But there's some of you who have won. You have won victories. Those scars are beautiful. Those scars are beautiful. God has turned your ashes into beauty. Your your heaviness, and he's given you a garment of praise. That is not something small. That's something to be celebrated. Just like a woman who has given birth to a child has stretch marks. And so many people are saying, oh, I hate my stretch marks. They are beautiful. They are the product of something beautiful. I want to talk to the older women in this place, 50 plus women. I think one of the things, God is resurrecting the older generation. He is. Because I believe that The enemy would make you feel like you are redundant, that you are irrelevant, that you are past it, that you don't understand the world as it is because the world has changed since you were young. You know, you're there trying to struggle to work your iPad or your uh, iPhone, and uh, I still don't know how to work my um, 
and Blu-ray player. And I just discovered yesterday Apple Music. I know, I'm a bit late to the table. I don't know how to work my technology, people. But the thing is, for the older generation, we, that can make us feel like we've got nothing to give because we don't understand the issues and the problems of today. They are so different. What the teenagers are going through today are different to what you went through when you were a teenager. And so sometimes, and also, we've got all these young people on YouTube, you know, with their channels and, you know, their blogs and da 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 and it looks like they've got it all together. I mean, they've got great eyebrows. <laughs> they've got great eyebrows and they know how to contour. And, uh, you know, they've got it worked out. They're on their, their fitness plan and they know how to do their squats and... And you think, well, what can I teach you? You've got it all together, obviously. But let me just share with you some stats about the 50 pluses. Ready? It says here that the 50 pluses, for example, were the first adopters of e-readers. They're actually the number one buyer of books. In the U.S., 70%, they have 70% of the disposable income in the U.S., 70%. They make up 80% of those who spend on premium travel. And they are the third, in, this, in the U.S., they are the third largest economy. First being the U.S. and the second being China. In Britain... They are all about self-care and development. This has become a priority to the 50 pluses. Women over the age of 50 have also become the biggest buyers of beauty products in Britain, inspired by the rise of older makeup and skincare models. For the first time, it's been claimed that the older age group have outflanked the younger generation in terms of spending money on their looks. The rise is thought to be down to the marketing of anti-aging products and a realization from the brand manufacturers, that older women still care about their appearance. UK residents aged between 45 and 54 took the most holiday visits abroad in 2009. 7.6 million visits abroad. People aged 50 to 74 spend just over twice as much per year on theatre and cinema tickets as the under 30s. Spending by the under 30s fell during the decade of 2000 and 2010, while it rose substantially among the other age groups. This is over 50s, man. You're having the time of your lives. <laughs> this is not the time to be quiet. This is the time to get your groove on and get your mojo back and start to share your story. We need your story. It's time to show your scars. This is what this weekend has been all about, that you would understand that your story matters, that you would understand that this is not the time to be silent. This is the time to speak up. How many times have I gone on YouTube and listened to a lot of people saying a lot of things that are absolutely rubbish? And I'm thinking... Who gave you permission? Like literally, who gave you permission to start your own channel and, and say all this stuff that actually does nothing for, for nobody? I look at all the books in the bookstores and think, where are our stories? Where are our stories of what God has done? Where are our stories of victory? Where are our battle stories where we have looked our giants in the eye and said, in the name of Jesus, I am going to have your head. <laughs> where are our stories where we have cried and cried and cried and God has come and birthed life where things were dead? Jesus was on the cross dying for the sins of the world. Even then, he was not silent. He said, Lord, Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. If you are still going through your story, it's not time to be quiet. It's time to praise. 
It's time to lift up the name of Jesus above your circumstances. It's time to show your scars to the women around you so that they can gather around you and lend their strength to you and give their stories to you, which are going to strengthen you and encourage you and put courage inside you. You might be dead in the ground like Jesus three days and you're like, this is all dead, it's all dead, it's all dead, it's all bad. But even then, you have to know that your story is not just a good story, nor is it just a necessary story. It is a resurrection story. It is a rescue story. It is a love story. It is a powerful story because everything about your life has resurrection all over it. You might be in the ground, but your resurrection's coming. And then when you come, that's a time to show your scars and to praise your Father in heaven. When I was, um, when we were singing, this is a sound of freedom, I felt the Spirit of God inside me start to rise up, that this is not the time to be silent, this is the time to praise. This is the time to speak of his good deeds. This is the time to share our story. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to spend some time and we're going to praise. But it's not just any praise. It's not just singing the songs. It's not just saying, thank you, Jesus. This is you saying, I will lift my voice. I will not be silent anymore. That I will share my story that I will speak to the congregation and I will tell the whole truth of how dependable you are, that I will take my place in the congregation, I will take my place in the community of women, that I will speak of his good deeds. Are you ready for that, ladies? A practical thing that we're going to do is that those stories that you started in that creative session with Matt D Ditton, B Britton is that... We're going to ask you if you would like, if you, were, if you feel that you would like, is to send your stories to us. We want you to send your stories. And what we're going to do is we're going to collate some of them and we're going to put them in a book. Because it's not just your story. It's our story. And it's not just our story. It's his story. And the story continues. So we're going to create a beautiful coffee table book that's going to be illustrated so that whenever you open it and look at those stories of the women in this place, that you would feel courage enter you. So I think we're going to put a, it's up there, the email address. So just, you can take a photo of what you did this afternoon and send it. Or you can write it out if you want to work on it a little bit more. We can't guarantee that all the stories will make it into the book, but we will use um, as many as we can. But it's going to be something beautiful. The other thing we're going to do besides praise God and say, yes, Lord, I'm going to take my place in the congregation to declare your good deeds and, show my, and share my story, is that I want you to find another woman. I want you to find another woman, not now, but after or this weekend, or this week, I want you to find another woman and I want you to share your story. Even if the scars are open. But that's okay. God sees, God hears, God knows. God comes alongside and so do we. We're here to confirm all that God has promised. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand with me? We're just going to worship for a time. But please take this as an opportunity to make a decision. Not to minimize your story, but to say, yes, Lord, I will tell my story. And let me just share that Psalm 40 again, just quickly. Hmm. I've preached you, to the whole congregation. I've kept nothing back. God, you know that. I didn't keep the news of your ways a secret. Didn't keep it to myself. I told it all. How dependable you are. How thorough. 
I didn't hold back pieces of your love and truth for myself alone. I told it all. Let the congregation know the whole story. There's truth in your life. There is truth and power in your life. And God has wrapped it in your story. Let's go.